Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hamweavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager, and I'm your host today. Today's Textiles and Tea is sponsored by Greener Shades. If you're looking for metal-free acid dyes, check out, with that are in gorgeous colors, of course, check out Greener Shades at www.greenershades.stillrivermill.com. We will have questions today as always. Please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. Love your comments in the chat, but I can't see the questions. So if you'll put them in Q&A, that would be great. Today, we have Lauren Batt. Lauren received her associate degree in fine arts at Franklin College in Lugano, Switzerland. She finished college in Georgetown University in Washington, DC. And after college, she moved to Paris to study painting, painting conservation, and printing. She returned to DC and continued printing and began working on sewing soft sculptures. She eventually settled in Paris, in, I mean, Par in, settled in France. Lauren has exhibited her work worldwide, including HGA's 2019 and 2020, 2020 Small Expressions exhibits. Welcome, Lauren. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be on your roster of uh, amazing <laughs> artists, truly. We we are excited to hear more about your work. Your work is very outstanding and we've loved having it in Small Expressions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our first question is always the most important, which is what is your favorite tea? Well, uh, you may have noticed that it's dark here where I am. I'm, I'm six hours ahead of you. <laughs> so it's 10 o'clock at night. I should be sipping a little brandy, but uh, I do drink a lot of tea during the day. And the one that I drink tons of in, in French, I have it here, a nice box. You can see it's called Brûleur de Graisse, which translated is fat burner. <laughs> and it, it makes me think that as I sit here doing my sedentary sewing and painting, that I'm actually burning off mountains of fat. And, and uh, the ingredients, you know, are like, a, a trip around the world in your armchair. There's there's mate and green tea and uh, guarana and birch and all kinds of things in there. Wonderful, I like that. I'm sure that would be very popular here. So to get, so to get started, I'm curious, how did you get started in fibers? Uh, well, I didn't actually think of myself as a, as a textile or fiber artist until very recently. I've always been a painter in my mind uh -huh. of uh, figurative narrative works. And it was also the easiest answer to give when people ask me that dreaded question of, you know, what, oh, you're an artist, what kind of work do you do? And I would say, I'm a painter. Um, but the one thread that's always gone through, no pun intended, um, my work is is a is a, a sense of relief, and not in the sense of you know, uh, what a relief, that's over. In the sense of depth and layers, and um, you know, layers of history, culture, uh, customs, emotions, uh, family, generational uh, layers, and. Um, that was a theme in my art or and all along to earn a few extra bucks i was sewing these soft sculpture dolls um i sewed some life-size ones for a bookstore window in washington dc um and i was sewing when we lived in new york later on i was sewing these anthropomorphized animals you know, dressed up as in their human personalities for a wonderful store that was existed and no longer exists in Soho in New York. So I had that background in there sort of on the side. And at one point it just seemed natural for all these different strands to 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 meld together and form a kind of a 3D um I don't know a pa painter or pulpture or you know painting and soft sculpture at the same time. And 
um, recently, I don't know, five or six years ago, I was featured on a, in an online, um, on an online site called Artsy Shark. And a woman that some of your listeners may know about, I don't know, her name is Rachel Beal. And she started something called the Textile and Fiber Artist List. She contacted me, she saw the profile, she contacted me and asked if I wanted to be part of this list. And I, and I thought, well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm a painter. Why would she want me? And then the light bulb went off and I thought, well, actually I am also a textile artist because uh, in my more recent work, I've been sewing these three-dimensional characters to fit into my painted scenes. So um, I joined and, and I opened the doors to the world of textile art. And, you know, with a lot of looking around and research online, I've just been amazed by what I found. Well, you, you talk about all these places that you lived, you lived all over the world. So how do you think all of those places that you lived and all the traveling that you've done, how has that impacted you as an artist? Very much, <laughs> tremendously. Um, I have to say that the first traveler in my life was my mother who came from her native Sweden after World War II she came to the United States uh, looking for a change of life, some adventure. She met my father and settled down and had us. And she was always, uh, for us kids, she was, she was always different, but in a really good way. She was kind of this exotic, shining um, creature uh, with a, a, a bit of an accent who lived in, in an American suburb. And, and it went the other way for us when we traveled to visit her relatives in Sweden and we had the culture shock of our lives when we were small because we found our cousins lives were so different from ours and much simpler closer to nature but also that they had preconceived ideas about us as spoiled Americans so then we were the different ones and uh, that that thought, you know, or that feeling of being different has followed me um, for different reasons ever since throughout my life. Um, I would say as far as my work is concerned, um, I tend to go around like a walking sponge and I absorb bits and pieces of street life as I go. And my husband's job, uh, took us to live in a number of places, usually four years on average, but sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, enough to, to become part of the place at any rate. And so I've been really lucky to live in some dynamic cities, Western cities. I've never been to the Orient, um, Paris, New York, Stockholm, um, where the street life is like a 24 seven spectacle and there's great museums for reference. Uh, we moved to Costa Rica in the early 90s and much later on to Uruguay and traveling around the neighboring countries was, you know, I was having multiple aha moments as I uh, encountered just the incredibly inventive indigenous art and craftsmanship from centuries past and the contemporary folk art in the markets there. And um, it just blasted the confines of my imagination. And um, so in Europe too, uh, every small village has like their own museum that has this mashup of, of exhibits of everything, craft work, but anthropology and taxidermy of these, you know, wall-eyed, dusty old animals. And um, my favorite are these, um, plaster or, or paper mache statues, pedagogical statues of uh, anatomical models where you have the guy, you know, with all of his colorful muscles exposed and uh, his organs and his eyes staring out at you. Um, I'm fascinated by all of these windows into local culture and the craftsmanship that it shows. And 
the most important thing for me has been actually living in some of these places and the realization that no matter where you are, um, it seems to me anyway, the people uh, are more similar than they are different. Uh, mostly, you know, we all want to be loved or love or for our children to have better lives or we worry about our health, we want respect. Um, and so that's pretty much it. <laughs> well, more and more, I was gonna say that uh, we're not traveling anymore. Uh, we've been in France for about 10 years now, but with the passage of fleeting time, which gets faster, I feel as I get older, um, I'm more and more, I like the, the place I like to travel best is my own little studio here. So I have so many ideas that I probably will never get finished. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, though. That's a good thing. <clears throat> well, one thing I loved about your work when I was when I was going through your website and looking at everything, and I stumbled up on your, um, you know, on all the websites always have like their bio and that kind of in the CV and that kind of thing. And I clicked on it, and it just struck me because you view the most mundane things really different than everybody else like <clears throat> instead of just writing down your bio and listing it you do this wonderful collage kind of thing um and it's just delightful and it's also more memorable I mean I when I think of a bio now I think of yours so can you talk some about how that decision came about thanks for that <laughs> um it came about uh almost naturally, because I actually, I have some trouble myself with, uh, I guess what I'll call website art speak. Um, I'm not, not to diss any, anybody, any other artists, deep thoughts that they express on their websites. It's, I really admire them for being able to express uh, their concepts even if I have to read them, you know, occasionally through a couple of times before I can grasp it. Um, but I'm, I'm too literal minded to, to, to express uh, concepts that way. Um, and there's so much random uh, elements in my work that the, the sponge thing. So uh, there are a lot of things that I feel more than I can verbalize. Uh, get my best ideas when I'm walking and there'll be these vague visions that I'll flesh out later on when I when I come home and um, since my life has been so influenced as we just said by the moving around uh, from one culture to another from one place to another I figured that that was the most important thing to highlight in my in my bio and I always feel that I show things better with images than with words. <laughs> well, these are amazing. And, and I, like I said, watching that, reading it, um, I will remember so much more than if I had just seen <laughs> it written well, out. It's really wonderful. That's, and the, one that's, thing, the other thing I really love about your work, it's so colorful and whimsical. But are the topics and the meaning always whimsical? Or talk some more mm -hmm. about your meaning. No, not not really. Sometimes, yes, and and definitely colorful and whimsical uh, helps to draw the viewer in. Mm -hmm. um, but um, no, no, I'm very obsessed with fleeting time, as I mentioned before, and how there seems to be less and less of it as we age. Um, and in, in, implicit in that idea is a persistent anxiety about our mortality. Uh, I think about that a lot. Um, uh, but I still empathize a lot with the less dramatic uh, universal desires of, of people and, you know, hoping for better lives or just less solitude or to be more organized <laughs> like me <laughs> or a bit more exceptional or hoping for more understanding or less judgment from others. Um, some, you know, one person's whimsy is really important for another person. Um, this one is from uh, what 
a series I call ex voto boxes, but they're not really ex voto boxes. We may talk about that later on. Um, it's, it shows a woman that I saw in the Metro one time I was riding in Paris and I saw this woman sitting a few seats ahead of me and she, was, she had a book in her hand and which showed to me that she was kind of serious, but she was looking off to the side with a preoccupied look. And she, she was just sort of a bit transparent, a bit mousy. And I asked myself, well, what would this woman wish for in her life? And the answer I came up with was that she wanted to be listened to. She wanted somebody to hear her and not to be passed by. So that could appear whimsical, but at the same time, uh, I think it's it's something that a lot of us can relate to. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well, the part is I don't know if this is this series, but you also have a series about guardian angels. Is this? And here's two of the images from the guardian angels. Um, can you talk about these two and why that theme? Why a guardian angel theme? Well, the the ex voto series came first, um, and and. <clears throat> It came about because I had seen uh, in, in Latin America, but in Europe as well, in a lot of churches, you see these uh, ex votos that sometimes are, you know, dramatic, stormy shipwreck scenes with some kind of deus ex machina up in the corner with their halo and their wings ready to save the, the, the poor people who are drowning. And, um, I've, I've always found them very touching in a way. Uh, in Latin America, you have people falling off roofs and being gored by bulls and being deathly ill and um, always being saved by this, this kind of guardian angel. Um, and so I, I took that idea and turned it around and turned it into a series of boxes where the people are uh, not giving thanks after the fact, but wishing for something before the fact. And um, from that stemmed this idea of guardian angels looking over us. Uh, I got the seed of the idea when I was visiting uh, from Uruguay, I was visiting um, in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And I stopped into a church to cool off on a really hot day and uh, watched as a man came in and approached, there, there was a, a wooden sculpture of a deposed Christ in front of me with you know, all the, the little blood drops dripping down. The guy took his hand, knelt by him and started chatting with him, this intimate conversation. And, and I was just really intrigued by that. I thought, you know, uh, what's going on? I wonder what he's asking. What does he need to have happen is, in his life? And, and I suppose that this Christ was like a guardian angel for him. Mm -hmm. So uh, I took that idea and started making my own guardian angels, but they're more um, the guardian angels uh, that you might invite over for a beer. <laughs> a lot of times that <laughs> they help with the small existential <laughs> problems in our daily lives. Uh, the mafia one before was a bit more uh, maybe a larger subject. You know, mafia for me was a stand in for any kind of dominating organization, criminal or not, that enforces its agenda uh, over others through the threat of, of uh, violence or exploitation. Um, here, the guardian angel of those who don't follow through, I got that idea uh, remembering a, a professor I had, a printmaking professor, so I used to do a lot of printmaking, um, who was always hammering at us every day. Uh, you have to follow through to the very end with your work and make sure it's finished. And that stuck with me. For me, for me it was um, an important uh, an important idea, not, not just in artwork, but in life as well. And her, her thread, her broken thread that she's holding up, uh, well, it's kind of a wink to a, a textile <laughs> world too. Not finishing projects, uh, abandoning them, 
Um, she's there to help us make it through. The guardian angel of those who are unloved by juries. Uh, <laughs> I, I made that one originally, uh, probably in reaction to an umpteenth rejection for a, a call to, uh, to artists. And I haven't had, a, a, you know, 100% luck in the fine art world <laughs> with, with my pieces. Uh, so I thought I would have fun with that. And happily for me, it was accepted into small expressions, <laughs> which I was delighted about. I was much happier about that. <laughs> Well, one thing I love in those images, and we may talk more about it later, and I don't know how many times I looked at them before I saw it, is that the base is a um, embroidery hoop. Yes. And I, and I see that often in the things that you use. And, um, and what we could probably talk more about that later. But, you know, as you're watching, look for those in the images as we go along. <laughs> so, um, and, and I wanna talk some about symbolism because your work has so much symbolism as, as you were saying. So how do you design your work? Do you come up with, oh, here's a symbol and now I'm going to build around that symbol or do you start and then kind of go with whatever the piece tells you to do? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's more the latter. Yeah, it makes total sense. Um, I tend to start off with a very vague idea. Um, and uh, the symbols usually come later on, um, but the vague idea can come, a, a lot of times you're working on something and it will engender a new idea. Just, you know, the more you work, the more ideas just pop out from somewhere. Um, or sometimes I'll be looking for a box, a container in a, in, a flea in a flea market somewhere. And I'll come across something and it will just grab my attention and say, take me home, take me home, use me, use me. Uh, and then the idea will fit into the box somehow afterwards. Um, and like I said, a lot of times when I'm walking, if you, you go out walking and move forward and detach yourself from the sort of daily uh, grind, that's when the best ideas come. And then um, they need to be fleshed out later on. And there's a challenge of uh, translating that big idea into a physical work. But that's usually, I mean, for the most part, where the symbolism comes in. The guardian angel that we just looked at with the broken thread, I had that symbol uh, pretty early on in my mind. <laughs> but uh, sometimes a symbol will spring from um, an expression like thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. I have a guardian angel. It's actually, it's right behind me. Um, it's uh, the guardian angel of those who are stuck inside the box. And that angel has a, a little guy sitting on his knees whose head is literally inside a box. <laughs> but sometimes um, they're, more, they're more obscure. I just love it because I, I find when I look at it, I just start thinking, what, what does this mean? And it, oh, it could mean this, or it could mean that. And you know, I, I don't even care what it's supposed to mean. I just enjoy where I go when I well, look at that. That's what's so, so much fun about, for me anyway, is when people look at my work, they see totally different things. Um, mm. And they, they invent their own story, their own new story about the elements that I've just put in place. And it's so much fun to hear them. And sometimes they're just completely off the wall or you know, much more controversial than anything I had in mind originally. <laughs> well, and that's what good art is supposed to do, right? <laughs> well, you also do embroidery. And um, this work, Don't Forget Me, uh, asked to be remembered. And it's the topic of being seen or being remembered, which um, is, is a theme in several of your pieces. So um, why is this a topic that you chose? Um, I think uh, 
it resonates with a lot of people. I know um, one reason uh, is that when I started off with the guardian angels and, and looking for these, these cabinets and old boxes in, um, in flea markets, at the same time, I, would, I noticed I would come across uh, sellers that had these big piles of old textiles, like you know, old linens and lace and pillowcases and doll clothes. And, and also piles, piles of old photographs of people who I didn't know, but they, they looked familiar to me from a different time often, but they just look familiar in their leisure time activities. That's usually when the photos are taken. Um, and I thought it was strange how these textiles and photos had been dumped at some point by somebody mm -hmm. with, the junk seller or in the attic or whatever, and the junk seller found it. And I, and I wondered about that. How did that happen? Who abandoned them? Why, how did that come about? And so for me, it was kind of a sad, but a happy coincidence that I found uh, these pieces and felt compelled in some way to bring them back to relevance. Um, and so I guess that's partly the theme behind uh, not being forgotten. And I, and I think that artists um, are often a bit perturbed by the idea that their own work could become irre irrelevant and end up forgotten in, in an attic or with some right. junk. It happens, <laughs> you see a lot of it. <laughs> well, again, I, I wouldn't have thought that's where that was going. And that's amazing. You know, I'd love to hear what you did think. <laughs> no, I think I was more concrete. Of, you know, I was thinking of some older person saying, don't leave me and go away and forget well, about that's me. That's part of it. That's part but the of whole it. concept of don't forget me as an artist, that's, that's amazing. I love that. That's underneath. True. Yeah, yeah, that's underneath. Absolutely. Well, the other thing I just want to talk a little bit about embroidery, and it seems to me that there's been a resurgence. I mean, there's been a resurgence in fiber in general, but embroidery, um, if, if you go to the website and, you know, um, to in um, um, like Facebook, I see stuff on Facebook, Instagram, you know, there's all these people now who are really going back to embroidery and, and updating it, you know, it's much more like what you were doing. What do you think the resurgence is about? I, I'm not 100% sure I'm qualified to answer <laughs> that question because I, I, uh, I'm a bit of a dabbler in embroidery. I, I love doing it, but I haven't done uh, a whole lot of it. I have to say uh, it, it's, it's a more recent thing for me. I would say that the crafts world in general has had a resurgence. Um, and I'm just awestruck when I see some of the, the gorgeous work that your other interviewees have done. And, and also, um, um, since I learned that I was a textile artist, <laughs> uh, I, I do a lot of searching on Instagram and online and, and see, you know, just so many amazing things that just totally break the barriers of what I think we used to perceive as uh, um, craft and, and handicrafts. Uh, you know, there's the, the, the 104 year old Scottish woman. Have you heard of her? She, she uh, organized a group in her town to, to yarn bomb the town. And they covered the whole town with these decorative knittings and turned it into like a fantasy land. Uh, I'm gonna look that up. <laughs> that idea, yeah. And you, you had uh, somebody on who showed us a, a, an absolutely immense piece that filled up the whole atrium of an office building. Um, a, a, a hanging, I guess it, you would call it a hanging, but it, it looked like something completely ethereal and otherworldly. And so I would say it's it's not just embroidery, but um, the crafts world in general. One thing I like about embroidery, and I'm sure other forms um, allow this too, but it, it really lends itself to both the written word and the visual. Mm -hmm. That you can you can do something very visual, but you can add words in, and it doesn't necessarily 
take away from the visual. And I, I've always enjoyed that about embroidery. I, I agree. I agree. 100%. Well, the other thing I've noticed about your work, and I'm sure everybody else has as they've watched along today, is that you really like to focus in on the everyday life and, it's in, and their struggles. And their struggles we all have, and we all deal with them. And they're important to us, but you don't see a lot of artists making that their theme where you have, and you really turned it into um, just the focus of what you're doing. So is your goal, what is your goal or your hope for going after those everyday themes? Uh, I think simply I'm hoping that people will recognize themselves in it perhaps a bit more than some other forms of art, uh, that it will touch a chord within them and or you know something about the atmosphere of the piece will 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 speak to them. Um, it, there are a lot of people out there that uh, tackle bigger subjects, bigger struggles uh, that are going on on our planet. And I sometimes I approach those topics timidly, but uh, I just you know. I don't know, I'm awed by the other amazing artists that can manage those topics with really strong and jaw dropping concepts. Um, I think that the everyday struggles are part of the struggle ecosystem though. I mean, they, they exist alongside the big ones and they often color how we approach the bigger ones. So they're, they're not irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not relevant. Um, you, it takes courage, I think, for anybody to put their work out there, um, to submit it to an exhibit or, or like you were saying, to say, I am an artist and be able to feel comfortable with that. Um, one thing that I was thinking about with your work is that your work is not the normal work like you were talking earlier about being a painter or even your embroidery isn't these little pretty, you know, little doilies that you would set out. Was it an issue for you to try to get your work out there when it was a bit avant-garde and kind of off-centered from what is the normal artwork? Was it hard <laughs> for you to kind of send your work out into the world like that? Uh, no, I'm not a doily maker, that's for sure. <laughs> but I'm surprised uh, to hear you use the word avant-garde, actually, because I, I don't consider my work avant-garde. Uh, I know it's not, it's not normal <laughs> in many ways, but, um, but I think, uh, I think it's pretty easy to look at. And, and again, since it has a narrative nature to it, people do tend to invest their own stories in it. Um, so I've, I've never felt that it was a struggle to, to send it out um, into the world. And I, I, most artists doubt, you know, whether their work is going to be well received or not, but, um, but there's little satisfaction in doing it if you're not going to share it. Uh, and it's always interesting to get feedback from other people looking at it. Um, I've had more of a struggle, I would say, um, finding a place for my work, which mm -hmm. I don't consider avant-garde, <laughs> uh, because the fine art world um, often finds it, um, uh, you know, decorative or a bit too cute, um, which sometimes makes me wonder if they really looked at it um, closely. And in the crafts world, it's sometimes too weird. Um, or, you know, there's always something that's too small or too big or, <laughs> uh, but um, I, you know, I've become kind of shy actually of looking for, for galleries. To, to show my work in because it's kind of a, a struggle and galleries are also struggling, I think these days. So mm -hmm. they tend to st stick more with their 
their field of, of confirmed artists. Um, so I'm, I've been hanging out more online and uh, that's where I found the Small Expressions show and was very grateful for that. <laughs> well, I have to admit when we first saw your work in 2019, we just, uh, we were all in the office then and we were all like, oh my gosh, look at this, look at this. <laughs> it just was such a wonderful reaction to a piece of, of artwork. And the other thing I was thinking about, like, especially that one that says um, the guardian angel for the, um, that you don't finish things, unfinished projects yeah. or whatever. I remember when I looked at it, I was like, oh my God, that's me. I never finish things. And I just kind of laughed. And then later I thought about it and I thought that's what was so wonderful about that piece. Because when I think about, it, I don't get things done. It really can be kind of a way of beating myself up of, oh, I don't get things done. But when I looked at your work, I could think about it and laugh, you know, about it. I was yeah. like, oh, that's me. <laughs> And it was such a neat way That's of doing so it. So gratifying to hear. Yes. <laughs> it's me too. It's me too. Uh, it's a lot of people. But I'm so gratified to hear the part that it made you laugh. I hope that there's um, that there's a humorous element in my work too that also helps people connect to it. In other words, we can see our foibles with, you know, with with a bit of perspective, a humorous perspective, uh, in 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 what I do, that's what I'm aiming for. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk a little bit about how, um, not so much how you make your pieces, but um, especially you talked some about this already. But the ones that are like in a box, and one of them was in a. Um, I think you said it was a record player case. Yeah, uh, people think it's a suitcase. But right, right, right. Actually, uh, I, I bought that in a flea market and the guy I bought it from told me that it had been a record, an old record player case and they, they took the mechanism out. Um, but that's one of the situations in which I saw the box, to me it looked like an old fashioned suitcase. And the box gave me the idea. Uh, it's, it's, the, um, it's actually one, a big version of one of my ex voto boxes called Help Me to Take Risks in Life. And so the idea of the suitcase, it, it links, you know, uh, automatically to the idea that as soon as you walk out your door, basically you're taking a risk in, in, in your life. Um, I just made the, the setting a little bit more dramatic <laughs> with the guy uh, heading straight down the, the gullet of a sea monster. But um, I, I, I love the idea of taking these old things and transforming them into something else and giving them a new life. Uh, in the case of the embroidery hoops, um, it's slightly different because I just love the way embroidery ho uh, hoops look. I, I think they're an amazing looking piece of hardware. And they're also obviously a bit of a wink at the textile nature of the pieces, but they do serve uh, a serious structural um, role. Uh, in many of the guardian angels have them around their waists because they, they attach the torso of the angel to whatever kind of box or structure it's, it's sitting in. Oh. Um, and in, in this case, the hoop is stretches the canvas across uh, that that the, the piece is sitting on, so that it can sit on it and not, you know, fall through. Uh, but they literally hold everything together. Uh, they, you know, they have a, a look of simple hardware about them, but it's such classy hardware. <laughs> so, what's next for you? Uh, that's a good question, Kathy. <laughs> You've done so much. What's next? Oh, no, I haven't done 
an awful lot, there's so much more to do. And I'm very slow. I don't think I mentioned that yet, but uh, I'm much slower than anyone has the right to be in this day and age. Um, uh, but I have a lot, a lot of, one of the problems is if you're working on a series, before you get to the end of your ideas, you're already off onto something else mm -hmm. with a ton of ideas. Um, mine has gone off in a few different ways. One is that um, I've started making an, a new series of boxes that involve those dusty old taxidermied animals from all the, the small museums across France. Uh, I'm sort of working on a, a cabinet of curiosities, you know, which is where the old uh, early scientists used to uh, house their, their products or the research that they went out into the field to do. Uh, there's one in, I live in a village where there's a castle that has one of these curiosity cabinets. Um, and so I immediately wanted to work on that idea. So that will be coming up with some strange looking, uh, possibly extinct, never before seen creatures in them, trying to live harmoniously with possibly extinct hominids as well. And the basic title is, why couldn't we have learned to get along? Um, there'll be variations on that. And also at the same time, you can see in this image here, um, that's a, a boat model that I found in a flea market and transformed into a, a sort of COVID rescue ship with the people on it um, are perfectly self-sufficient. They've got all their toilet paper and all their food and their house and their little <laughs> cow to give milk and music and wine and everything. And they're heading off to a, a better place. Again, escaping from the, the, the sea monster. And I wanna do a whole series of, of boxes using ship models that I will make uh, recycling all the Amazon cartons and other delivery cartons that I've collected. I'm a yeah. rat packer. I'm sure many of your listeners are too. Um, and uh, on this theme of sailing from a darker place to a lighter place, um, another way that I've been able to extend the lives of some of my work is to repurpose them in Photoshop. And that's what you see in this image here. The boat model exists. Uh, somebody bought that and has it in their home, but I was able to take it along with the sea monster from the risks box and a few other creatures and cut them out in, uh, cut out you know their photos in, in Photoshop and then put them in, into a whole new scene um, that can be printed. Uh, in additions, and it, it's sort of uh, a nice a nice way of extending their lives uh, in another form, and it's also a, a nice challenge for me. I'm learning an awful lot about Photoshop and how it works. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. I have to say though, I I want to go to a flea market with you, and I, I want I want to watch how you work because I mean, do you walk along and go? Oh, that's a cool box. I have no idea what I'm gonna do with it. I think I'll keep it. Or do you say, that's a cool box. I bet I can make something out of that. There's a bit of both scenarios um, because if you're, it depends on the flea market too. Some of them are, are small uh, markets and villages scattered around. And so it's kind of the luck of the draw, what you're gonna come across. And if you see something that looks really cool, but you don't know what you're gonna do with it right away, you take it anyway, because it may not be there next time or somebody else is gonna get it. Um, and then there, there are the, the, the big warehouses that are more like, uh, they're not junk shops, but they're just great big, flea markets and there I tend to take my time and walk around uh, and occasionally spot something like you open the door 
and you see this configuration inside with some shelves there. I mean, not on the other side, a drawer in the bottom. Oh, I can turn that drawer into something. I can make a bed out of that drawer. And then, you know, the idea will spring out of that. Um, that happens from time to time. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I've also been the, the last thing I'm I'm working on now is uh, using the Photoshop uh, idea. I've been illustrating some children's books with a Swedish writer friend of mine. Oh. And so it's the same idea of taking. Um, well, I have one here. I don't know if you can see it. Taking these three dimensional dolls, these Aww. creatures and cutting them out in Photoshop and then placing them on painted backgrounds that I've done on an iPad app, actually. And that's a lot of fun. I've been enjoying that quite a lot. Well, we may have to revisit so we can see those. Those sound amazing. <laughs> I wanna see those. <laughs> well, let's take some questions from our audience. First of all, I have to say that um, we have a, a listener watcher uh, Fazia Rizvi, who she she watches all the time, and she just wanted you to know that she too has a um, cabinet of curiosities, and that she just loves it that you have one too. So just to pass <laughs> that on. I'm working on one. I hope I get it done. There you go. <laughs> before, I, before I don't follow through. <laughs> there you go. Um, Sue Sari wants to know what size are the angels in the series. Uh, there's so many angels. So, oh, okay. uh, uh, they're, they're little tiny angels that show up regularly, um, in, in, in the, like the boxes that you can see behind my head. Uh, -huh. uh, they're, they're, they're the ones that show up in the corner, like the little, um, deus ex machina there to help save the day. Uh, but in the guardian angel series, they're various sizes, but nothing bigger than, uh, I mean, I'm looking around, nothing bigger than about a foot and a half, I think, the box, so the angel inside. I have one bigger box, and it's one of those boxes that I did find and open up and said, oh, I know what I'm going to do with this, because it was quite tall with these little shelves. And I turned it into the guardian angel of those who live on the top floor with no elevator. Okay, I remember that seeing angel's that. angel's a bit bigger. <laughs> well, Andrea Thiessen says, love what I see from Lauren. As a fine artist, she has that in quotation marks, herself, she does tapestry, painting, and assemblage. I mm. truly think we all need more humor and whimsy for creative problem solving. Keep it light so we fly higher. Thanks for sharing. Oh, that's oh, great. Thank that's you. wonderful. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's another person who crosses media boundaries, apparently. Yeah, yeah. I think there's more and more people who do that. Well, Karen Devins Devininsky wants to know, uh, your work is wonderful and reminds me of the works of artist Joseph Cornell. Are you familiar with him? Uh, vaguely. Okay. Um, His, does she, she wants to know if you have painters or textile artists that you admire. Uh, oh, a million painters. Um, and a million textile <laughs> artists too. But the names are going to escape me. I, painters, they go, they range from, I, I studied a lot of art history in college. So uh big periods for me are uh the renaissance me medieval renaissance uh more primitive art um but then you know the colorists of uh post-impressionist colorist bonard um matisse um and i love contemporary uh wise uh myra coleman um i don't know if you've heard of her she's an illustrator, but she paints her illustrations. And she's both whimsical and extremely thought provoking. Um, and, and very, her work's very moving for me. Um, textile artists, textile artists. I, I don't have names coming up in my head. I'm sorry. There's so many when I look I know, through. I know, it's hard. 
<laughs> well, while you ponder that, let me give you another question. Okay. Um, the material that you make your figures out of, is it like a plain weave cotton? What do you use? What is your material? I use canvas. Oh, okay. Different, different grades of, of, of canvas painting, you know, the same canvas I would paint on. And then you um, use acrylic paint? And I use acrylic paint. Okay. And um, to, before I actually sew the, I don't know, I have a, like a leftover head here that didn't work. <laughs> so I don't know, it'll turn into something else. Um, it's made out of canvas uh, and, and sculpted with thread and needle to give the features. And then I'll coat it with a, with a, a coat of acrylic medium which stiffens the, the surface enough and fills like the pores a bit so that you can, no, it's not just so, it's just okay. a, a clear medium. Um, and, and after that, it makes it easier to, to paint on. Um, well, when you said that about being the slowest artist in the world, I was thinking your work's so labor intensive. You know, it's one thing to go in and just start painting, but you have to do the sculpture first and then you paint it. So, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not surprised that, and I'm assuming you do all the sewing by hand. Yeah, I do, I do. Uh, I used to do much bigger work. Uh, I did these big paintings with sort of quilted uh, people hanging in front of them. And then I used a sewing machine, but, um, but for this smaller work, I do it by hand because otherwise it's not, there's not enough precision for me, but, um, you know, in, in today's world, it, at least in the fine arts world, uh, I would say, you know, spontaneity and speed are sort of the, the catchwords. And it's frustrating because I try sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll go off and try and do something more slapdash and, and fast and more uh, stylized perhaps. And I just never seem to manage it. I always end up back. <laughs> In, in detail. So I guess detail is in my DNA. It is, it is. Well, someone has made a comment. I have never heard this before. They say, I too have sable. And that stands for stash accumulated beyond, <laughs> beyond life expectancy. I have never heard that, but I live it. I, you know, if they say you, you can't die until all your projects are done, we're all gonna live forever, right? Oh my God, that's a guardian angel project. There you go. Sure. There you go. John, you get, <laughs> tell, you get idea. partial credit. <laughs> I'm writing that one down, Sable. <laughs> Shawnee, sorry, Shawnee gets partial credit. Thank you, Shawnee. <laughs> um, Deborah Prindle wants to know, has your work been inspired by the 3D fabric hangings of Central America? Uh, I'm sure I've seen them, but not directly in, inspired. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, if you go to a, a market in, in Guatemala, for instance, you see so many different things and so many textiles and weavings. And um, I do remember having, somebody gave me, I think one of those, um, uh, I don't know what they're made out of. It looks like canvas too, with the little people, uh, little sewn people, sewn on, uh, lying on beaches and they're wearing their colorful bathing suits and, and you have a, a sort of collaged fabric background. Uh, I probably did get some inspiration from those as well, I've got to admit. But uh, more than that, for me from Latin America were the carved wooden masks and you know those incredible incredibly inventive creatures that come in all different colors and shapes. And um, I don't have anything here to show, <laughs> to illustrate, but uh, more that kind of work. Somebody has written Ar Arpilares, A-R-P-I-L-L-E-R-A-S, which I'm pronouncing badly because it's probably Spanish and I don't know Spanish. So maybe that's what they're referring to as the cloth with the little figures on it. I'm oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm learning again. You have there you to go. 
write that one down for me. I will. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I, I appreciate you being on here so much. I, I appreciate you sharing your work and your thoughts and uh, your time with us today and showing us these beautiful sculptures. And uh, we look forward to seeing you continuously in small expressions. We love you. We stretch our arms out to you and accept you. We love your work. Thank you for the push. And thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I tend to be more of a listener than a speaker. So I'm glad I, <laughs> I got all the way through. You did great. It's you wonderful. did great. It's been wonderful. I've and if y'all want to see more of her work, go to her website. It's beautiful. There's so many other pieces there um, that she's mentioned. I love the one about uh, the people who live in tall buildings. It's hilarious and, and so beautifully <laughs> made. So be sure you check out her website at laurenbat.com. Uh, I do want to thank again our sponsors for today, Greener Shade Dyes. It's um, from the Still River Fiber Mill is the um, producers of the Greener Shades dye. And their goal is to provide organic and sustainable products, including the Greener uh, Shades dyes that are non-hazardous, non-chrome, low impact, heavy metal free acid dyes. So if you're looking for a safer dye, check these folks out at gs.com dot still river mill.com so thank you so much for being our sponsor today if you would like to sponsor textiles and tea or your guild or uh, your business please go to our website at we spend die.org and there's information there about becoming a sponsor we also want to thank the fiber trust for donating for the uh, supporting this programming. If you'd like to see more programming like this or the programming you saw last week for Spinning and Weaving Week, um, please go to the website and join or donate at weedspindie.org. Just a reminder, convergence registration is open. Be sure you get in there and get the last of those classes that you want to add. We'd love to have you there. Um, if you've missed an episode, you can go back and watch all the past episodes and the one today on uh, Facebook. You don't have to have a Facebook account. You just go to the HGA account and you can watch them there. Next week, I'm so excited. We're going to have Dawn Edwards on and she's going to talk about her incredible felting work. Thank you all so much for being here this week. I hope you have a great week and don't forget, happy tea.